And when it comes to political content, there's the, there is in fact a huge thumb on the scale that no one will really own up to. Mm -hmm. I think we want answers. Why won't you own up to it? Can't you just admit that you're doing it? You know, will you put it in writing? Will you just, if you want to say this is a liberal platform and conservative speech of X type is not welcome on our platform, then just say it and we'll go build our own platform already. Mm -hmm. You know, but and that would also be unfortunately something that these folks would have to take to their advertisers yeah. and say, by the way, we just told hundreds of millions of Americans to go jump out the, the window. So, you know, you can see why there's a financial interest in not wanting to make that explicit and instead mm -hmm. keep things in this liminal zone where it, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. How did it happen? Nobody knows. Yeah. And I don't think people are willing to accept that, especially in an election year. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by... Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And we are back for yet another fantastic episode of Moment of Truth. We had on today Commissioner Nathan Symington, who uh, is my favorite kind of nerd. He knows <laughs> everything about everything and uh, more than everything about a bunch of things. Uh, what an incredible joy. I'll get to that in a second. But before I do, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything we have cooking. Um, maybe there's a Fall Fellowship of American Statecraft application. Uh, there's uh, signing up for AM Fridays, which is our uh, lunch series on Capitol Hill every Friday, spring, summer, and fall, where we bring in public policy experts uh, to speak on important issues of the day and give you free Chick-fil-A, more importantly. Uh, there's the backlog of this show. There's the contact form so you can reach out and we can find a way to get you involved. We're ramping up our plans for presidential transition, fingers crossed. So be sure to reach out. Um, if you have been listening to this show for years um, and have not, uh, seriously, just just reach out. We, we're always pleased to find out who's listening to this show. I ran into someone at a random party in Ohio a couple of days ago that said that they've been listening to this show for over a year. Um, so it's always cool to, to hear from these listeners, um, really high powered people across all of government and beyond. Uh, but as I was saying, this week we had on Commissioner Nathan Symington, who was nominated to serve as commissioner of the FCC by President Donald J. Trump, and he was confirmed by the United States Senate in 2020. Uh, Commissioner Symington uh, previously served as the senior advisor at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. Our friend Adam Kandub was there over uh, over there as well. And in this role, he worked on many aspects of telecommunications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the United States government's role in the Internet. Prior to joining the commission, he was senior counsel to Bright Star Corporation, an international mobile device services company. And in this capacity, he led and negotiated telecommunications equipment and services transactions with leading providers in over 20 countries. Before joining Bright Star, he worked as an attorney in private practice. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School and holds degrees from the University of Rochester and Lawrence University. Commissioner Symington grew up in Saskatchewan, Canada, and he became a United States citizen and now lives in McLean, Virginia with his wife and three children. Do not hold his Canadianness against him. We do make him <laughs> justify it at the very end in the members only segment. But man, we just had a fantastic episode talking about every I mean, I've got like a list a mile long of all the topics we covered. We talked about confirmation battle, censorship, privacy, Internet of Things, AI, broadband, Starlink, Elon Musk, tech infrastructure, TikTok, um, and, and so much more. I just thought it was a fantastic episode. What did you think, Nick? I think the commissioner has totally raised the bar for what qualifies as an expert now. He knows <laughs> a lot about uh, everything. It was it was truly um, fascinating. And I, I seriously, I think we could have gone for four or five hours uh, yeah. had he had the time. Yeah, we were really testing the limits of a hard out for that. So it was absolutely fantastic. And in the members only segment, we talk about some some very interesting subtopics, including, you know, he's a Canadian. Why should we trust him? What is he terrified about that no one else is looking to? And much more. In case you've forgotten, you can become a member on YouTube. You can be a truther or a statesman. And there you get the episode 24 hours early on Sunday, as well as a host of other members benefits, including these members only segments. So please uh feel free to support the podcast. It really helps us keep this thing going. Uh, the goal is to make the podcast entirely self-sustaining uh, so that all those lovely donor dollars can go to other things at American Moment. Um, we'll go now to Commissioner Nathan Symington. 
Commissioner Symington, thank you for coming on the podcast. Delighted to be here. We always like to hear about how our guests got to where they are today. Uh, you're not the first FCC commissioner that we've had on, um, but I, I would love to get the, the second sample. Uh, wh- how does one become an FCC commissioner? Tell us the, the tale. Well, uh, if you look at the early history of the FCC, um, the engagement was very often on the military side or, yeah. or some, some, some sort of technical side. Over time, the FCC has sort of evolved to have more lawyers, more regulatory lawyers, more telecom bar members, mm-hmm. and that's understandable. But as for me, I, I was a pretty left field candidate. Um, I'm actually, I only became a US citizen in 2017. So I wasn't even thinking about working in government when I uh, got out of school. Um, I was uh, I was asked by the Trump administration to join the NTIA, which is the federal uh, communications agency uh, for non-commercial purposes like, you know, um, say, aviation spectrum, that kind of thing. Um, and then while I was there, uh, the, the ball bounced in funny ways. And I wound up at the White House explaining um, my pet theories about back end telecom finance and somehow rather got the nod. That's fascinating. And so before that, what, what, what kind of legal background did you have? And, and tell us a little bit just about the kind of career trajectory that got you to the point where you, you were even vaguely colorable for, for such a role. Well, um, I, my background is as a, uh, originally as a tax lawyer. Then I sort of evolved from that into a finance lawyer. And then on the finance side, there's a lot of interesting things to do in telecom. Um, so if you look around you, uh, just about everything in the world is financed by some mechanism. I mean, you know, for example, if a car company makes a car, they don't just sell uh, the car to someone and then sit back for seven years and collect the loan payments. They mm-hmm. want to recycle their capital. So they sell it into an investment vehicle and get their capital back. And then meanwhile, the payments go to pay the bondholders, that kind of thing. So everything is financed in the world. That includes phones. Phones are a really tricky thing because with a phone, Unlike with a car, you can't just send hired goons to take someone's phone. <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, the personal taste of hired, uh, the personal touch of hired goons is great, but you can't really you can't really repossess someone's phone, right? So, uh, so the problems of financing them are, are sort of complicated, and for that reason, it, people can wind up overpaying for them. And if you can solve for that problem, then that's good for the companies that want to turn phones over more often. That's the at the manufacturers. It's good for the networks because that way they're renewing contracts, and it's good for people because they have better phones at less money. Mm-hmm. So I was working on that kind of thing. And then that sort of evolved into business intelligence on where the world phone market was going in different jurisdictions, mm-hmm. which is a telecom regulation thing. It's difficult to get people on the commission once they've worked at one of the regulated entities, because then they would have to recuse from so many things. So I was sort of in an, an interesting position where I knew a fair bit about what was driving international spectrum policy and government decisions there without actually having worked at a company that owned licenses in that mm-hmm. area. So that's, that's how it worked out for me. That's fascinating. So tell us a little bit about that confirmation process. And I guess, uh, you know, maybe preface it with a little bit about what your time at the NTIA was like. Uh, you know, we're on the eve of potentially getting a aligned conservative president again, and uh, plenty of the listeners of this podcast might be wanting to throw their hat in the ring for, uh, you know, subjecting themselves to the U.S. Senate. Uh, t- t- tell us that story and, and what it was like to be on the inside of it. Sure. So the NTIA is a uh, a uh, small agency with a lot of responsibilities. It's got a well-respected scientific bench, but then it also does broadband uh, policy and it does international stuff. So, you know, so for example, one of the things I worked on there was um, putting together national government coalitions to address conflicts that they were having with domain name registrars over access to who owns a domain. Now, you might feel that that's an invasion of privacy under some circumstances, but if there are, for example, counterfeit drugs or threats or human trafficking associated with a particular domain, national governments want the ability to to work on that. So the NTIA was the point of contact with the US government. Irritatingly, we got everyone on side worldwide. We got Iran on side. We got everyone aligned with us, and we still got outvoted by the domain name registrars. Someone should look into the voting setup. There. <laughs> anyway, but so I was I'm working at NTIA on stuff like that. Spectrum policy, obviously, is another big one. The headline issue at the NTIA, from the administrator's point of view, when I was there, was a petition to the FCC regarding Section 230. Now. Uh, There are various views on Section 230. (laughs) Some people think it's the best thing ever. Some people think it's terrible. For the record, uh, both President Biden and President Trump have argued at different times that it should be repealed. So it's not really a a partisan issue. Um, But the NTIA petition was, I think, one of the most interesting steps towards addressing some of the problems people are having uh, about 230, without doing prior restraint on speech or requiring that any particular thing be said or not said. It was more taking an approach that I'm uh, familiar with from securities law, where you get the safe harbors of the 230 protections, but there are certain things such as, for example, um, having clear standards around what are the grounds for removing or demonetizing or deboosting a post. Mm-hmm. 
um, that would that would be part of being entitled to those immunities. What's the securities law uh, analogy that you'd make? Uh, well, with 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 securities law, there are all, there are all kinds of safe harbors that you can get within. So, for example, if you uh, if you want to have a private company that doesn't have to comply with public company stuff, then part of that is restricting the ownership. And once you have a, once you have a hundred different shareholders, then you're in a situation where you have to start to, uh, becoming a public company. But on uh, the analogy I was thinking of here is that. Um, is that if you wanted to have the 230 protections, you can operate without them. It's not it's not as though you have liability just through not having the 230 protections. Mm -hmm. But they, but it becomes a little bit more opt in instead of I'm a social network and I get them no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. Right. So you you would opt in by, for example, having an appeals process or uh, through having um, or through having grounds for post removal that go beyond just I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I mean the language the language that's in 230C2 is. Um, uh, vile, filthy, obscene, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. So trimming back that otherwise objectionable so that otherwise objectionable doesn't mean corporate management <laughs> objects, yeah. you know, um, that, that, would, that that would be part of being entitled to use those 230 immunities. Anyway, so it was a very interesting petition. Um, I know for a fact that uh, a number of senior Democrats actually found it very compelling. Mm -hmm. However, it uh, it was a heavily politicized issue, and so it's a big part of what people were talking about at my confirmation. Um, even led to a hashtag, uh, Stop Symington, which I think I retweeted seven times, despite really, <laughs> despite really nice graphic design. Which, which lobbyist in Washington, D.C. was in charge of that? You know, I would, I would really love to know, because it was a combination... Here, I've got a picture on my phone. It's uh, It was a combination of fantastic graphic design. I'm, I'm going to blow it up into a poster one day. And then at the same time, uh, remarkably ineffective at, at actually stopping Symington. So, uh, so there we go. There you go. <laughs> Look you at can, that. You can you can show that to the cameras right there. Stop Symington. Yeah, Very nice. Good color theory. <laughs> I know, like 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 sort of vapor wave. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, so that was a big issue. And then um, I guess the other thing that was sort of driving my confirmation specifically, this is both an NTIA issue and an FCC issue, was the battle for the future of 5G. Mm -hmm. Because um, at the Trump administration had as a big priority getting more 5G pickup in the United States. And that required in turn clearing a lot of spectrum with which the Pi Commission did very successfully, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of spectrum that it actually cleared for commercialization and stuff that it teed up for the next commission to, uh, to auction. Um, but there were different models of how of how we were going to commercialize 5G and what we were going to do with it once we had it. And so again, those those competing currents led to um, led to some factors behind the uh, behind the confirmation to sort of get from my case to the more general case, since this is about your listenership. Mm -hmm. um, my big takeaway is that uh, it's my big takeaway is that you need people in DC who can do the DC process stuff. But if that's the major axis that you select along, then you are going to miss out on opportunities. So in in my case personally, um, I happen to know uh, quite a bit about the back end financing of fleets of devices, and that wound up being a great entree to further explore this stuff once I was sitting on the commission and ask, for example, what are the uh, what are the barriers, the concrete barriers to adoption of more smart manufacturing equipment. What does it look like as um, a CFO if my boss asks me to investigate this or my board asks me to investigate this? What are the barriers? And having a background that's not purely regulatory has been really handy there. Um, if a uh, future administration wants to explore this space and maybe get some of your, uh, get some of your listeners nominated for positions, then I would say it's really important not to let each agency go its own way. Rather, we have to have a coherent story about um, where we came from, where we are, where we're going, and we should think about putting together agency staffs that will be able to get us to that goal coherently. And if we do, the other side of it is we've got great tools to work mm -hmm. with. So give me a, a an overview of, you know, there's sort of two categories of issues um, that, or, or two, two frameworks under which to understand the kinds of things that that these commissions get up to. There's the things that are sort of good governance, nonpartisan issues, and then there are the things that have a more ideological valence. Give us a kind of overview of, of what the, the big primary issues facing the commission these days are in each of those two categories. Sure. So in terms of good governance, um, probably 95% of what the commission does is nonpartisan mm -hmm. or bipartisan. Anyway, it's got broad support. 
and um, it falls. It, so it falls into that category. I mean, the FCC is is very very present in so many aspects of American life. This microphone in front of us, it's telling us what frequencies are available for that microphone and coordinating it with the rest of the spectral environment. Uh, when you go out on the street and see a radio tower, there are commission rules that say how high the tower is and what kind of warning lights it has to have, and all this is you know the fruit of hard worn experience and a lot of uh, hard worn experience, a lot of expertise. Um, there, there are other things as well. So, I mean, the commission was founded basically for, to do two things, to run broadcasting and then to run the AT&T monopoly in the Bell System Monopoly era. Yeah. Obviously, it's been a while since we've had the Bell System Monopoly. It's over 40 years at this point. But it's still a lot of its bones left in how the phone system works. Um, and I mean, regulated monopoly. Hey, at least we didn't nationalize the industry, which is what every other country did. Mm -hmm. uh, they either just launched it from the government in the first place, and it was a ministry, or in the case of the British, they nationalized it once it grew to a certain size. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the FCC was founded to run those two uh, those two things. Um, and today, it has a very complex technical portfolio that covers um, uh, everything from how much you're allowed to. Uh, charge for interstate phone calls and on what basis and um, how we how we supervise that. It uh, we figure out what uh, frequency satellites should be operating on, what the rules are for satellites to talk to Earth stations. We're increasingly getting into coordinating the emerging field of um, of phone to satellite, satellite to phone, and we've got a general supervisory authority over just about anything that intentionally radiates a signal, anything above a, a certain very low power level and anything above a certain very low frequency level. So um, so in terms of any piece of electrical equipment sold in the United States, pretty much it has to have an FCC label. Uh, famously, that was a problem that Apple got into <laughs> very early on with the power supply in the Apple II, and they had to shield it because it was causing radio interference. Yeah. Um, so of course, speaking of things that happened 40 years ago. so. Um, so th those are some examples of non-controversial things. Uh, in terms of controversial things, well, this commission has actually been pretty non-controversial and non-partisan a lot of the time, so that's good. But the partisan things are bad. Yeah. Um, I've obviously got a point of view on these in public statements, so I'm just I'm not going to hedge a lot. I'm just going to say what I think. Yeah. Um, the the headline in um, DC Chatter has been Title Two. Title Two is shorthand in FCC land for classifying broadband. Um, Internet access services as a common carriage service rather than as uh, rather than as, as a, a less regulated type of service. And what common carriage means in this context is that we're saying that broadband. Um, uh, well, the, the thing that that interests the tech industry most is that broadband uh, can't discriminate between the treatment of any two bits. Uh, they have to have the the same priority. They have to have the same. Uh, ability to reach from one terminal to another. This but, is what people call net neutrality. And net neutrality, uh, I, I would note, by the way, that there are plenty of countries that have net neutrality laws that don't have anything like our Title II, because our Title II is one of those leftovers from the regulated monopoly era. It's really a price regulation law as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. The the no bit discrimination part is, is sort of an incidental reading of what happens when you take that 1934 framework and you start applying it to cable modems in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So, um, so personally, I think it's it's sort of incoherent to talk about Title II classification of something you can't do a rate making on. And I don't think anyone can do a rate making on on broadband because that would mean that they know the the right mix of debt and equity, you know, the right price of the debt and equity of every broadband company in the United States. It was hard enough when it was one, you know, when it was AT and T. I think if you ha actually had that knowledge, you should just go to Wall Street and open the most successful telecom hedge fund of all time, <laughs> you know, because you would yeah. have some sort of magic knowledge that Wall Street doesn't currently have. Yeah. And you know, you'd make a billion dollars on your first day. So I would definitely do that if I could figure that out. Um, so it's so so that's an example of, of something that's a controversial partisan issue, but only within DC. Mm -hmm. So if we rewind, um, if we we rewind um, about ten years ago, eh, nine years ago, um, President Obama made a YouTube video specifically uh, specifically criticizing the then sitting. Uh, FCC chair because of rumors that he was going to be insufficiently prescriptive and regulatory in his net neutrality order. And so, you know, it was the White House was seen as having a huge amount of skin in the game and huge amount of, of credit at stake with this. Um, then we go, we go back uh, to 2018, um, 2017, 2018, when uh, President Trump's chair, Ajit Pai, was uh, repealing the Title II classification. 
And it was much nastier than that. We're not yeah. talking YouTube videos. We're talking about people stalking his family. Yeah. You know, John Oliver's segments really got people going. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really crazy. People were calling in bomb threats. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, there, the, the rhetoric around it was that, uh, was that this, this insane Trump Republican FCC mm -hmm. was going to stifle th uh, free speech mm -hmm. and make everyone get the internet one, you know, one character at a time. Yeah. The, the, it became the current thing. <laughs> it became the current thing, right. Yeah. As, as few things before or since ever have been at the commission. And so what we see now with our uh, Title II position at the commission, because we voted to restore it, is that we've taken the current thing and then we did it because it was once the current thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the all the energy is out of the room. Mm -hmm. All the energy is out of the room. Um, it's, it's just sort of... Among the advocates, they're going through the motions of the same advocacy that they did in 2015, when at least the purported concern was that your broadband provider was going to try and create a mini AOL, where mm -hmm. you had to use their search, and you had to use their chat, and you had to use their e-commerce, et yeah. cetera. And it never happened. Of course. And, it, <laughs> and I, I think, it, well, and, and if there was a thesis for that in 2015, I think there already wasn't a thesis for that in 2015. But now we have multimodal internet. Yeah. You know, we've got all the phone companies setting up their own fixed wireless businesses and doing great, taking in tons of customers. Mm -hmm. And obviously we've got the new satellite internet sector. Um, Elon Musk hadn't even applied for his first Starlink license yet in 2015. The first commission filings were in 2016. So, um, so when we've had this entire new mechanism of providing broadband on a totally different infrastructure basis just blow up out of nowhere and we're still rehashing arguments from almost 10 years ago so do you think that um the climate surrounding a lot of these issues in dc has gotten it, it sounds like you're saying that that the interest kind of peaked in it during the trump era and is now back down but like, give us the history of how politicized these issues have been over the commission's history. Oh, well, um, the net neutrality has been a question since the 90s. Um, and in the in the 90s, there was a clear there was a clear separation between who your broad, uh, I'm sorry, who your Internet service provider and who your phone company were. They were just different people. You might have, for example, uh, your local baby bell is your phone company. And then you would call up Earthlink, who was your ISP or some other ISP like that. And they would be the specialist who would actually take. Uh, who would actually announce your IP address to the internet and vice versa allow you to receive traffic. Um, the, once those started being bundled into single broadband packages on a, on a different technology, we're getting off phone lines um, and onto either DSL or cable. Once those started getting bundled, then there started to be this question, well, isn't this actually a common carriage situation? Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that your phone offers two services. Number one is running a phone line and number two is letting you talk over it, right? And again, there've been conservative voices on either side of this. So if you look at, for example, Justice Scalia's uh, dissent in the famous Brand X case, he has this great analogy with a pizzeria that I'm not gonna rehash, um, but, it's, but it's worth- Of course reading. it was a pizzeria analogy. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Right. He's, he's, Have you done poutine analogies in any of your <laughs> opinions? You know, but no, but maybe I should start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maple syrup. Yeah, know? there we go. Yeah. Well, it, you know, by the way, there's a maple syrup cartel in Canada. That's that's it's a whole other spot. <laughs> should, that's that's the members only section. <laughs> We're we going to go. talk about. You that. folks should look into that. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so, so there's so there's, there's always been this question. Actually, the first net neutrality principles that artic articulated at the commission were under a Republican chair. Yeah. Uh, they're under Michael Powell in, in 2004. And then they were voted on as a commission policy statement and passed unanimously in 2005. In slightly modified form, but you know, the core values were the same. Certainly, certainly they weren't watered down. It's just mm -hmm. emphasis that had changed a little bit over a year. So the commission has always thought that Americans should have the right to access the information that they want to access online, and that your broadband provider should not be interposing you between a service that you want to read it, it, itself between a service uh, that you want to reach and a, a customer who wants to reach mm -hmm. it. Um, but the devil's in the details. You gotta figure, why do we call it the internet in the first place? The internet is so-called because it's a way of interconnecting a wide variety of otherwise incompatible networks. You gotta figure, go back to the early 90s, you had building networks that were just local area, mm -hmm. but that were set up so that an entire building could be wired and people mm -hmm. could internally send email and share printers and such. You had phone networks, totally different technology, cable networks, totally different technology. Um, you had all these networks that were stitched together by the emerging new technologies of TCP IP that had been developed in the 70s and then sort of reached maturity in the early 80s and the associated protocol suites with those. And stitching those together into a, an internet, a, a, a network connecting everything and everyone who was on any of these subnetworks raised really interesting questions. You gotta figure if you were on Comcast and you had a friend, let's, let's say who was on Frontier, 
then you you email him, he emails you back. You he sends you a file, you send him a file. There's a there's a rough reciprocity in traffic. And that way it makes sense for the the network operators to say, "Hey, we're just going to offset our traffic against each other. We're not going to charge each other for transit." Mm -hmm. And they set up ratios, mm -hmm. like sort of like a leech ratio in downloading, right? <laughs> yeah. Where there's they'd say, "Okay, you know, we're we're going to have a lot of interconnection. We're not going to like charge our, charge each other pennies mm -hmm. constantly on a back and forth basis over this." Because there'd be finance, there'd be finance costs associated with that. Yeah, it wouldn't exactly. It wouldn't yeah. be worth it. Yeah. But with net neutrality, this raised a whole new issue. What if you have to treat every bit equally? Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't matter if you have a peering agreement with the other guy. Mm -hmm. You have to take his traffic, even if he's just dumping it willy nilly onto your network. Yeah. And 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 the specific sort of most salient economic rationale here was the. Uh, dramatic uh, rise of video content over the internet, right? That's exactly right. Because yeah. with a video network, it's providing content to the rest of the internet, but it's not taking significant Right, it's, it's a highly asymmetric, like download becomes disproportionately much higher than upload. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And if your whole model for how to handle traffic pricing is based on reciprocity mm -hmm. between existing physical networks, then the existence of someone whose only function is to pump traffic into that network, that to be fair, that consumers want to access and yeah. that they're accessing on the same terms from their point of view as any other website, mm -hmm. then it breaks the model. It breaks the model and you have to expect that that's what drove a lot of the business reaction saying, no, well, you know, we might agree with the principle of net neutrality, but we didn't agree to take um, vast new quantities of traffic that we haven't built for and that we have no one to charge for. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, if they can't charge the person who's providing that traffic, then they have to add that to the consumer's bill. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, so in a, in a certain sense, it's the consumer who pays for net neutrality and um, the content company mm -hmm. that gets free transit out of it. So it's not, you know, necessarily all that balanced. Anyway, this is a, a little bit of a history of how it, of how it, uh, some of the considerations that got us to this mm -hmm. point. By by like 2014, 2015, this was turning into a holy war issue where the where the concern was, well, if we place any restrictions on um, if we allow the ISPs to place any restrictions on anyone's behavior in any way, then they can use it for nefarious purposes. And so we must have an absolute bar on this. And that's how Title II gets conflated with net neutrality. Michael Powell wasn't thinking Title II when he said net neutrality. Mm -hmm. If he wanted to classify it uh, broadband as Title II, he could have mm -hmm. done it. And what's more, there have been multiple bills from both sides of the house. Um, uh, uh, from both sides of the aisle in, in both the House and Senate that proposed net neutrality laws outside of a Title II framework. Mm -hmm. And those all failed. So this has led a lot of people to conclude that the real purpose of Title II was to get a larger regulatory framework over internet traffic and that net neutrality was only ever a stalking horse for mm -hmm. it. And then the sub subsequent lack of rate making also suggests to me that Title II, which is about rate making, mm -hmm. is was not really the point. The point mm -hmm. was, you know, a degree of control. What, what what's the what's the candy apple? Like what what is the what what is it a stalking horse for? Like what would that broader uh regulatory surface area give you know, I won't use the term nefarious, but but motivated actors the ability to do. We're the era of the TikTok ban, right? There's the question of what exactly does it look like to try and regulate speech over the internet in any way. In the early days of the internet, it was easy to make the argument, these are startup companies, these are nerds talking to each other in their basements, they don't move the needle really, we can let them have some freedom. It might, you even feel good letting them have some freedom. But America has had regulated media for a long time, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, before First Amendment jurisprudence expanded after the Second World War, mm -hmm. the FCC could informally shut down individual radio personalities. Like Mae West was informally blacklisted from the air for several years for office. Was Father Coughlin ever actually shut down? That's, again, that's an interesting question. I actually don't know that yeah. as well. I yeah. think he was at I one think he point was banned in time. From the yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and that's part of what motivated, no doubt, the, the more, uh, the broader reading of First Amendment jurisprudence in this area after the Second World War. But but informally, yeah, we could we could take people off the air, and we did um, in the early days. Uh, and although the, that was relaxed somewhat, we still continued to have the fairness doctrine in, uh, up until the I want to say late '80s. I believe Mark Fowler, who was uh, President Reagan's FCC chair, managed to get it finally repealed by '87. I think that's right. I yeah. have to look. That's that's. I believe it was in the Reagan administration. It's at the end. So yeah, that eighty-seven. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and that's widely credited, by the way, with launching conservative talk radio as a modern medium. Um, so there's the FCC has always had this sort of uncomfortable thing where we're not a media regulator in the sense that that European countries have one, that Canada has one. Mm -hmm. 
but we do that is to say like a substantive media a regulator. substantive media regulator yeah. right that that will just come in and say you you have to uh, you have to say this about a topic you're not allowed to discuss that other topic but nonetheless through its control of broadcast licenses and then the government's asserted higher interest um in in what's allowed to be said online the rationale for that is mm -hmm. that if you have a broadcast license someone else doesn't have one mm -hmm. and so the government has a high, uh, heightened interest in the content of your mm -hmm. speech that's been upheld at the Supreme Court, so it, you know it's that's going to be with us. So the point is that that we've in the United States we've used that rather slender thing to have something of a media regulation um, capacity within the FCC, despite the First Amendment. Yeah. So if you remember Janet Jackson's nipple, that's what was going on. <laughs> you know, um, there was and there've been other incidents since. I mean, uh, you know, as far as in obscenity enforcement yeah. and whatnot. The seven words. The seven words Carl you can't say on TV. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And there was a very uh, there was a very interesting incident involving a firefighter, of which I will say nothing else, but people can Google it um, <laughs> in uh, local media. I want to say 2015, 2016, a station in Richmond took a uh, was severely punished for that one. So, um, but. Uh, of, of which the less said the better right now. Anyway, uh, so we've always had this little bit of substantive media regulation trying to come in through the cracks. Yeah. And, um, and the, or, or using structural regulation to put a thumb on the scale in a particular direction. That's a great yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. Right. And so there's, there's, I think, very much the question right now from people who think we should have regulated media in the United States, mm -hmm. what exactly would that look like and how do we get there mm -hmm. in an era where at this point streaming companies have more subscribers than cable? Yeah, that flipped very recently. I want to say late 2022. Yeah, but and obviously cable isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But the point is that streaming is just now such a major factor in how uh, Americans consume and receive information, mm -hmm. as well as social media. Obviously, that anyone who thinks we should have regulated media has got to be looking at this and sort of wondering how they can leverage existing institutions, mm -hmm. existing laws, uh, to their purposes. And what are the worst case scenarios for that beyond just like being able to? basically take people off the air? That's an interesting question. I don't know exactly what it means to take someone off the internet. Even the most disreputable people seem to find some way to get some yeah. kind of a web presence. Mm -hmm. But with the internet, there's always a question of, are you using someone else's platform? And the answer is almost certainly yes, because unless you built your own server, you're using someone else's platform. Mm -hmm. You're using someone else's cloud. Mm -hmm. You're using someone else's um, intermediary line. DNS security. Yeah, right. yeah. exactly. That, that's, a, that's a great example of a service people don't think about. You're using their DDoS protection. Yeah. And um, because you're always using someone else's facilities, then the, the then those are all potential choke points. You mm -hmm. lose your DDoS, you lose your DNS, and you're not off the internet in some absolute sense. but once you've been demonetized or deranked on a platform, that might be all it takes to derail your, the career that you've been making mm -hmm. on the basis of what that platform was prior willing to provide to you. Mm -hmm. So that seems very much like disciplining your content creators from the point of view of a, mm -hmm. a company. Now, of course, there's no right to have a platform and a newspapers, for example, would fire people in the mm -hmm. past before. But this feel, still feels like the rules can change out from under you on a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. Maybe they even change after an informal mm -hmm. call from the White House or something like that, <laughs> right? No, that would never happen. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, it's it's supposed to be a scandal that, that uh, President Nixon had the heads of some of the networks into his office to yell at them. Well, yeah. I don't know. Is, 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 that, is that really so different? The temptation's always there, right? Yeah. So... Uh, so I guess my, my answer is um, the larger a degree of control that exists over what is allowed to be said on the internet or who's allowed to say it. I mean, that's absolutely a tool for shaping discourse, just as it would have been if you could dictate content to TV or even just say what the standards were for your editorial content on TV. Mm -hmm. So. So I want to go through a couple of the major controversial flashpoints that that are coming before the commission. Right? I'm going to kind of get your theory of the case on on each of those issues, because I think that you know, there, there is a very thriving debate um, on what sort of conservative orthodoxy on each of these issues should be. And we've had people on all sides of that on this show. You know, we've had everyone from Alan Bakari to Ken Buck to Brendan Carr and others, uh, and everyone has a different perspective and, and often they clash very, very heavily on it. Um, let's start with censorship. What, what say you, Commissioner? What, what what must be done about tech censorship? Yeah, well, obviously, um, yeah, obviously, TikTok's very much in the news here. And my answer is always, when we see TikTok, what are we doing about uh, tech censorship in the United States? Now, 
the there's a there's a sort of a silly argument that I think I just want to address preemptively, and that's that well, it's only censorship if the government orders you to do it. First of all, there's a case before the court on that exact point right now, and what degree of influence was exerted or was could properly be exerted. Mm -hmm. But then second, if you control um, if you control one of the main platforms through which information gets to people, um, I'm not interested in parsing the distinction of whether this is censorship or not. Mm -hmm. The idea that it's, well, that it's purely private and that there's no larger social interest, I mean, that's not an argument we accept mm -hmm. in any other industry. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I mean, we, we, it, we're we not in the Wagner era, right? We're not, we're not saying, you know, you've got absolute freedom to build whatever car you want, even if it blows up every time someone gets in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, this, yeah. this whole concept of absolute freedom of contract is, you know, has, has been, thrown away by American jurisprudence mm -hmm. for like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this, so uh, what should we do about tech censorship? Like just to substantively engage with this question, we have to ask what is te tech censorship? How is it implemented? How is it implemented and what do we want to do at that level? It's, it's great to have values. It's great to have aspirations and desires, but what is actually happening? What can we do about it? Um, I guess the first question is I would like the tech companies to clarify to what degree this is a conscious policy decision and at what level it is taking place. If it is coming out of facially neutral policies that are being implemented in an actually uneven way, or if the policies are written such that conservative um, content is disfavored while liberal content is not disfavored, well, at, we, we have to ask what was the process by which you got there? Mm -hmm. And we maybe, by, if you want to talk freedom of contract, if we just bring some of this stuff out into the light, if we make people say, yeah, you know, formally our, our, rules, our rules say that you're allowed to say this, 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 this on the platform. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the rule is that if you do an ad that contains a gun, then we're going to say that speciously that this ad endorses violence mm -hmm. and therefore it's going to go off the platform. So if you want to uh, proclaim your second amendment credentials, then you can't be on our platform. You know, or we're go we're going to derank those ads or mm -hmm. remove them. Well, I mean, that's again, that's a, the kind of s the thing you were talking about that it's a substantive censorship via a structural means and a facially neutral mm -hmm. structural means because you know presumably that would also mean that liberal candidates who love gun control could also not brandish guns in ads. Mm -hmm. But you know, somehow one doesn't worry about this mm -hmm. so much. It's like Anatole France. You know, the poor like the rich are uh, the rich like the poor are prohibited from stealing bread and sleeping out of the bridges. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. You know, so so uh, my first question is what is happening second um to what degree are people hiding behind the algorithms yeah. we know that lots of algorithmic decisions contain manual adjustments and we know that those algorithmic decisions are very often manually overridden mm -hmm. what does it actually look like when this happens is anyone willing to open the robe on that and let us inside their um their apparatus the the, the, the party line on this is that it's all a black box we have no control the machine's alive and doing its own thing the last time i looked uh facebook had something like twenty five thousand um, independent contractors who review content manually i'm pretty sure they have written policies they have to follow yeah by the way that's a dog's life doing those jobs they have to look <laughs> at the, the nastiest stuff oh yeah for sure. i actually knew a guy that did that it, it, it's yeah. it's very corrosive to the psyche. Yeah. Yeah. And and I guess that leads me to an, another point on censorship that we have to accept that we actually all want censored platforms in that I don't want someone to be able to post uh, vile and obscene content uh, on uh, Instagram that my kid follows. You know, I don't want someone to be able to post... Um, let's say uh, torture victim, uh, uh, victims of, of the events of October 7th um, and say, you know, yeah, it's, we're, we're, we're going to revel in their misery or something mm -hmm. like that. There are all kinds of, uns there are all sorts of nasty people out there and they're mm -hmm. going to post nasty things online. And everyone wants a platform that's, that's um, moderated in some way. And that's what Section 230 is supposed to do. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be a blank check for moderation because it assumed people would use it to moderate all the nasty content that need, really needs moderation. So we all want censored programs, uh, platforms in a certain sense, but what? But I think what bothers us is a sense that and when it comes to political content, there is the, there is in fact a huge thumb on the scale that no one will really own up to. Mm -hmm. I think we want answers. Why won't you own up to it? Can't you just admit that you're doing it? You know, will you put it in writing? Will you just, if you wanna say, this is a liberal platform and conservative speech of X type is not welcome on our platform, then just say it and we'll go build our own platform mm -hmm. already. You know, but it's, and that would also be unfortunately something that these folks would have to take to their advertisers yeah. and say, by the way, we just told hundreds of millions of Americans to go jump out the, the window. So, you know, you can see whether there's a f financial interest in not wanting to make that explicit and instead mm -hmm. keep things in this liminal zone where it, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. How did it happen? Nobody knows. Yeah. And I don't think people are willing to accept that, especially in an election year. 
as being an adequate basis. Oh, well, you know, bad stuff happens. No one knows why. It always happens only to us. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, life's tough all over. I don't, don't think anyone's prepared to go there. So everything you said just now is basically non-controversial in right of center uh, circles as a diagnosis of the problem. What is very controversial, even amongst the most open-minded policy people, is is what can be done about it. So what's your personal theory of the best legislative and regulatory way to approach the tech censorship issue. It's tough because of course you can't affirmatively, uh, you, you can't affirmatively require speech of someone, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do compelled speech. Um, that's that's something that you got immediately enjoined when Florida tried it, for example. Um, you, you can't, uh, you, uh, you know, our, our constitutional order does, it puts some limits on what we can do in this. That's why I, I would encourage everyone to go back and take another look at the text of the NTIA petition um, regarding Section 230 from summer of 2020. Um, th what the approach there was, was simply to say you only get the 230 immunities if you, um, if you are clear and transparent about your terms of service, if there's a meaningful appeals process, if you don't write yourself a blank, che blank check with otherwise objectionable, if you have to start affirmatively defending specific acts of censorship and, and de-boosting and demonetization, et cetera, instead of asserting a blanket 230C1 right to do whatever the hell you want. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage everyone to go take another look at that one. Um, DOJ also had some um, some similar, uh, similar proposal around the same time, which I also thought was very good. And um, I think this is a, a good way of addressing the question, how do we preserve the constitutional order that we like? How do we preserve all the things about tech censorship that we like? And how do we, at the same time, get some accountability for the clear thumb on the scale, get people to define it, pull it out of the shadows? Mm -hmm. um, as far as administrative solutions, administrative solutions need require you to attract the attention of an administrative agency. That's the problem, and get staff assigned to it, mm -hmm. which is much more opaque than just rolling down to your state courthouse and filing a suit. Mm -hmm. I'd like to preserve that kind of right of action in cases like this. Yeah, private right, the actual enforcement mechanism is important here, yeah. both because of the limited nature of resources at the federal level, and right. then also because the federal regulatory employee base has priors. <laughs> yeah. um, so if, if you did something like what you're suggesting, how, this is a bit of a leading question, um, uh, how would the social media companies react? Like, would it be weeping and gnashing of teeth? That, that's my assumption. I mean, the, uh, the social media companies obviously would have some sort of a burden imposed on them by having to affirmatively meet standards to get the 230 uh, uh, safe harbors instead of just getting them by virtue of existing. And there are probably some cases where there are some aspects of social media models that might even be disrupted by this in a way that consumers might not like. Um, I'm open to the I'm open to that whole conversation, but I view those as comparatively minor compared to resolving the social problem of people believing, based on you know based on many many experiences that come together to form a mosaic, that um, that their speech is being stifled. Uh, to the degree that social media companies have attributed, you know, I mean, look, there's the whole Twitter files thing. There's the there's the Hunter's laptop thing. There are, but beyond that, there are just many cases of people's um, people's accounts just fading away to nothing, and it's not clear why. You know, there are cases of ads that were that are being rejected on you know, what seem rather specious grounds. If if there if the two thirty remedies are absolute, then no one has any recourse because that's all in internal corporate stuff. It doesn't have to be a black box if you can just go like there's no law against lying you can just go out on the street and tell lies if you want it's terrible mm. uh, but uh, <laughs> you know it, there's no there's nothing that stops the social media yeah. um flack from coming up and saying yeah you know it's a total black box and meanwhile he's he's very well like he personally knows the person who pulled the trigger on that piece of content yeah. that's 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 fine there's no reliance interest you can you, it's not fraud mm -hmm. um but just dragging it out into the light, being able to get discovery on this mm -hmm. question, maybe the truth is there's nothing nefarious going on. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, discovery would wake the American public up to some uncomfortable mm -hmm. truths. But I think myself, if there is a route to discovery on this question, and we had to ask the question, this piece of content, this prominent piece of content, something weird happened to it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what, how, and why? There's always a trail. At, yeah. at, I think at some point, then then you start to get a real sense that there's a cost to deprecating the the politics and beliefs of a, a large chunk of the American electorate and of your customer base. Right now, where else are they going to go? 
you know, yes, there are alternative pl uh, platforms and you can go to True Social instead of Twitter and you can go to you know, Rumble instead of YouTube. But on the other hand, there's so much programmatic advertising that just automatically goes to the biggest site in these areas. Mm -hmm. And we've and we've seen that even as, for example, X, formerly Twitter, um, has increased viewership and has increased time spent engaging with the site, advertisers have just flooded in droves. Now, the standard explanation there is that now the content is just so nasty that the advertiser can't be affiliated with mm -hmm. it. All I can tell you is that back when it was socially acceptable, I would see um, I would see uh, Middle Eastern clerics calling for you know the the torture and murder of people in in other countries, and there'd be a Ford ad right next to it. Yeah. So, you know, it was okay back then. It's not okay now because it's the deplorables who are more prominent on the site, I suppose. Well, and it cuts both ways, right? The the, the intensity of network effects can be shown. You know, how many people are on threads today? <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it's at, at the end of the day, like, network effects are network effects. Um, yeah. Okay. This guy, so, Mastodon, each, yeah. each one of those had a moment. Yeah. So, okay, moving on to something that I think is considered less um, ideologically charged, but 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 differently so, uh, data privacy. What is Commissioner Symington's theory of, of data privacy and how we should be thinking about it in an era where it feels like more and more of Americans' deeply personal information is utterly up for grabs and out of their own hands? Yeah, well, we've had a data economy of some sort since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Here's an example I like to give that you might have experienced personally. So if you're doing an online loan origination, There'll come a certain point where they're look, checking up on your identity, where they start asking you, which of these four streets did you live on? And it's in all caps. Mm -hmm. It's in all caps because that's running off a mainstream. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a mainframe. That's running off a mainframe, um, an old machine, uh, an old uh, an old system from the 60s and 70s. Um, that's the whole point of how credit bureaus, for example, are make it possible for you to walk into an auto dealership and walk out 30 minutes later with a car and a five-figure loan. Um, so there's a certain amount of data privacy that we've always given up as a matter of course in the United States. And that's been the, for the, the credit bureau industry, the direct mail industry, lots of things savory and unsavory, but it's just part of how things have worked. What social media did was to greatly update the frequency at which this happens and to tag it with location data and to start stitching these things together into advertising rather than credit profiles. Um, but this is definitely a very, you know, definitely a very big thing for some great background for those of your audience who are interested. Antonio Garcia Martinez's book uh, *Chaos Monkeys* has um, has a lot of insight into what this looked like around the Facebook IPO in 2012. Guest of the show, yeah, uh -huh. he's great. And uh, and part of I think what's really interesting there is how fa Facebook, well now Meta, but how Facebook at the time was trying so many different approaches in order to figure out how best to monetize profiles. And in fact, he was- How to monetize it at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right, right, There was right. no plan. And, right, yeah. and, it, and it turned out that mobility was actually the killer app yeah. for them. So in some ways that was hitchhiking off the, off the iPhone. Yeah. So, so that was sort of the innovation there. And of course, these folks haven't been asleep at the switch for the intervening 12 years. So you know, that's continued to evolve. So what does it mean for us to live in a world where this is how everyone engages? Well, these days it's not just social. Now, if you could have hacked the 1970s dishwasher and gotten all the information out of it, it doesn't store any data. It's yeah. you know, it's it's an electrical appliance. It's mm -hmm. like you know, hacking a vacuum cleaner, hacking a, I don't know, a a, a kid's toy. Mm -hmm. But these days, you you're going to have to pay someone soon not to put a microchip in your stuff. And if you look at the amount of data that gets phoned home mm -hmm. on a routine basis by dishwashers, um, by washing machines, house, uh, common household appliances, it can sometimes be very, very substantial. Mm -hmm. It might be more than a very busy internet connection mm -hmm. would have been 10 years ago. And the rationale for this, mm -hmm. the companies that are doing this are saying, someone's going to monetize this data if we don't. If we don't collect it, it's just going to be Facebook and Google and Amazon and uh, that are monetizing this data. So we might as well just actually get in the data business ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, this isn't ad just advertising data. This is utilization data, or it might be engineering performance data about their appliance, whatever it might be. Um, something very much in the news was uh, cars reporting driving uh, driver behavior information to your insurer. Do you have an expectation of privacy in that? Well, you probably click wrap through it. I mean, you can make the argument for it, right? Like those of us who are sloppy drivers should probably pay for a uh, higher pr price for insurance than those of us who are careful drivers. Mm -hmm. But yet it's this out of left field character where you just feel that everything is sucking data mm -hmm. out of you. Yeah, the M&M vending machine is taking facial data from me. The fridge is uploading 30 gigabytes of data. God knows what it is, you know. Right. It's the, it's, it's the totalizing 
sense that, you know, in a very small D democratic sense, Americans never felt like they were asked about right. that, you know? I, well, I think that, I think that's what makes it so compelling. And at the same time, what meets, makes it so hard to respond to, because I'm, you know, my, by laying out this, this history, I guess I wanted to get at the idea that Americans have shown a certain degree of comfort or at least resignation mm -hmm. with having some of their personal data out there, but we're not really prepared to the extent that which it would become alienated from them and made monetized independently of them or even against them. Mm. There's this feeling, yeah, is that we've had an intrusion on our personal mm. space. I don't think there's a social consensus yet about what should be allowed to be collected mm -hmm. and what it should be allowed to be used for. And that's why the federal government has struggled to define mm -hmm. what we should be doing in this space. Maybe the least controversial thing is <clears throat> it probably should not be exfiltrated from the United States and, and rolled into um, AI products in hostile countries. Yeah. Yeah, we can, <laughs> that, that's not very controversial, but that doesn't really really get to the heart of what bothers most Americans about this. Right, and there's the there's layers to it, right? Which is that, yes, that could be banned within the four corners of uh, you know, the law, but that doesn't mean that hostile foreign actors won't see that, you know, beautiful uh, steaming pie on the windowsill and try to grab it anyway. I got to tell you, everyone's grabbing it right yeah. now. Um, our data security laws were written in the 80s and it shows. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, I, I got to tell you, you can get location data on people very easily. Mm -hmm. um, you can, uh, this isn't even personal. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you can, you can order up a satellite photo of a, a specified uh, mm -hmm. tract of land for a few hundred dollars at this point, and mm -hmm. their they're optical satellites whizzing all, all mm -hmm. over. That's even worse because that's you know non-consent data. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, do we want to give up that facility, mm -hmm. or do we want to just figure out that how to assert a right against it? It's, um, I, I guess, as far as data privacy, I don't think we've gotten to a consensus on this, but I guess I would say there's a lot of money being made on it. And this money feels as if in some way it's being made on people. Mm -hmm. And there's not really a way to get at that revenue stream. And there's also not a way to separate you, mm -hmm. you from it, which is, I think, part of what contributes to the sense of violation. Well, and uh, the the territory and surface area where it's becoming relevant is increasing. You know, the, the place where this technology sort of cut its teeth was in products that were always free, these social networks. Now you're starting to see these same processes and economic concepts backfill products that weren't. So for instance, I remember a story from a couple months ago, uh, there was a television company that would give you a free TV, but it's got a camera on and it's watching you all the time. And you know, you could see a world where just leaving it up to individual consumer choice, people in search of, you know, that, you know, people, Americans aren't exactly doing fantastically financially right now, that they, they chase cheaper products that are giving up more and more uh, privacy protections. And at some point, this becomes a decision for you know society to make about what are the very human bounds of privacy that we are willing to accept um, and, and, and mandate across the board. Do, do you, how would you conceptualize where, where your comfort zone um, uh, is and and where you might draw lines if if you were made czar over such things. Oh well, <clears throat> uh, so well, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, heads would definitely roll. <laughs> um, so it's 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 an again. Uh, I guess it's hard to find something that's going to satisfy everyone. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are sort of horrified when they find out how much information credit bureaus have on them. But the alternative to that is an economy with no consumer credit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to a country that has a less developed consumer credit system. Uh, then credit gets really expensive and it's hard to get. And it's also high default rates for the credit companies because mm -hmm. they have a hard time doing a risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I mean, I, I, I got to say, I like being able to get credit easily. Mm -hmm. And so there's a question of how much data I have to get up to give up to do that. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, uh, likewise, everyone likes all of the benefits of this stuff. You know, it would be really nice to just walk into the grocery store, get your stuff, walk out, and then they bill you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that already, they already do that in China some places. But um, it would be nice to do that. But I, I set up the uh, Amazon Palm Reader thing at Whole Foods. Oh, you so did? That's, that's what I do now. Oh, yeah, right. that's terrible. All, 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 of, all of my trad religious friends say I have the mark of the beast now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's yeah. when they put the chip in your head that you've really got a problem. Yeah. But yeah. it's... Um, I mean, look, we all want the upside of this stuff and yeah. no one wants the downside. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what makes it so hard to really regulate because as soon as you start pushing back on it, you're going to make a lot of people very upset and they'll feel like they lost something. Um, 
it's it's very tough. You just don't, you don't want to get as a regulator. You can't stay at the level of good things are good, bad things are bad, and then <laughs> the difference because you know you've got to have legal penalties, yeah. you know, carrots and sticks, for to induce all this behavior. And that's that's sort of what I struggle with a little bit because I don't feel there's been enough public recognition of the upside and downside to the negotiations that have taken place over different kinds of private information. Mm -hmm. That's it. If I had to start pulling triggers tomorrow, then um, I guess the first thing I would say is I would um, is I, th I think we would need to quantify what some person's lifetime total data value is at present and ask how that is being monetized. Now, obviously, that's crude. That's going to change over time. It would have been different yeah. if you asked now versus 10 years ago. But, but we do it, right? Like life insurance policies exist. Right, like right. We, 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 we do have a way to price the value of life like we, right. we've done it. Yeah, right. And it, it people feel like it's a sort of a violation of, of the, the sanctity around some of these things mm -hmm. to price them. You know, that doesn't mean that you're really setting a price on it, but mm -hmm. it does mean that you're trying to figure out how to allocate resources in different scenarios and to feel and to find what just compensation is in mm -hmm. the case of violation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's it's obviously a tragedy whenever, you know, someone, let's say an industrial accident, they break their leg. I mean, that person might hobble for the rest of their lives. It might they might have PTSD from it. I don't know. But you can't say, OK, you get 800 billion million dollars you yeah. know <laughs> and i said that like yeah. you know like you remember it's like that simpsons episode with the 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 animator he gets 800 million billion dollars in a solid gold house <laughs> you know i mean you know for for a, an ip violation against or when a random contractor sues elon they get 300 million dollars the thing that happened <laughs> yeah yeah right 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 or or uh when the investors all make money but the stock purchase agreement gets bad then a, then a law firm makes what yeah. is it five billion dollars for a week's work or some such yeah um so, you know, there's always, there, whenever you see an instance of jackpot justice, the rest of us are paying for it in some other form. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, it's a sanctity violation. In some cases, it's just an abusable law. But I don't think we can talk sanctity in terms of data. But I do think that we can say people have quantifiable interests. Those inter interests are quantified in terms of what the market pays mm -hmm. for this stuff. Now, maybe we would even go to a further refinement and say, that someone is entitled to monetization off of that amount, or that someone, on the other hand, is entitled to refuse participation mm -hmm. by paying that amount, which then leads to the question, is it a civil right to be excluded and to, should we be subsidizing mm -hmm. it for people without the means? Mm -hmm. I don't, these are these are all such weird questions mm -hmm. that we, because we, we never thought there was any value in any of mm -hmm. this stuff before, but since, you know, com companies mm -hmm. with, let's see, nine, 10, 12 figure valuations <laughs> have been founded on that basis, like clearly there is, right? Yeah. So, um, but but I but I think if I wanted to at least start answering the question in a way that's least unsatisfactory to the most people, I would say we have to have a, a valuation here so that we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. We have some sense of what we're negotiating over, and it doesn't get swept under the rug and treated mm -hmm. as just digital flotsam when when in fact it's a colossal value proposition. Yeah, it's impossible to have a conversation about trade offs when you don't know what's on the each side of the equal sign. That's we just we just have a sense that there should be an equal sign. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, it's not that I, I know instantaneously the second this became a, a becomes a live conversation, the companies are like, well, there's no way to do it. They already do it. Like yeah. Facebook yeah. has a lifetime expected value for American consumers versus European consumers versus Vietnamese consumer. Like, right. They, they do this data anyway because they have to. Right. Right. Yeah. And it might not be known with certainty because yeah. there's but but on the same in the same thing, same way, the value of a bond is also not mm -hmm. known with certainty. Mm -hmm. Like that's just part of life in the yeah. market. Yeah. And I'm sure that there could be a, a highly, highly uh, lucrative freewheeling cowboy profession of, of you know, doing trading and arbitrage on 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 <laughs> on, on on the assumed value of, of lifetime data if, if we were to to actually price this stuff. You know, maybe Neil Stephenson should uh, call his agent. He might have just <laughs> that sounds like, a, that sounds like a, a pretty interesting thesis for a book. So uh, another element of this that that has been uh, sort of integral to to the privacy rights of Americans sort of being eroded over time is the fact that now everything has uh, a connection to the internet. Um, talk a little bit about uh, that issue. It's obviously a very live issue at the FCC. There's been some recent developments on it. Why is it that everything from the fridge to the car um, to the cell phone, obviously, but, but much more than that, have a wireless connection now? Yeah. Well, 
if, like I said, if you don't monetize your data now, someone else is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And so if you just own the, the channel which that data is produced, then the economics of it seem kind of crazy to not throw in a $2 Wi-Fi board and leech endlessly off the Wi-Fi that, that, uh, that your client installed mm -hmm. and send huge amounts of data back to the mothership. And what will we do about it? Heaven only knows. We'll do. We'll, we'll figure that part out later. Maybe we have an immediate path to monetization. Maybe we turn it around and sell it to somebody. Maybe we. I don't know if you've ever sat down and looked at the click wrap uh, for a car today. No, I haven't. It's kind of crazy. I'm not going to name names, but there's one country and it was a uh, company. It was, was reported on that claims uh, the right to disclose information about your sexual conduct in the car. <laughs> so like this isn't exactly paradise by the dashboard lights yeah. anymore. Like this is, you know, this is, I don't know what that means, but they also assert the right to collect genetic material inside the car. What? So I'm maybe gonna draw, draw a veil over it at this point and yeah. say like, this is probably TMI, yeah. but, um, but but the point is that there. I, I mean, I can tell you for sure that that would not hold up in a lot of courts, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, so there's so much that could in, in mm. principle be, in, be uh, collected that a lot of companies are not limiting themselves. Mm. They're saying, geez, we sat on the sidelines and watched while well, all these other guys built up this colossal data business. Mm. So what do we have? We have the consumers mm. and that's where we have to start monetizing them. Well, especially in an era where, you know, if you're a software company, you trade at this multiple. And if you're a hardware company, it's a much lower multiple. It's like all these hardware companies are like, man, like I, my stock price sucks right now. I really need a way to to get Wall Street interested. And especially in an era of AI, when everyone is monetizing proprietary data sets, it's like, what? I, I, I get the economic incentives here. It's not about malice. Like they're, they're obviously going to do it. And it seems like the regulatory message that um, is being sent is it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Right. And so might as well take the data while you can. I'm going to tear apart my washer and dryer <laughs> when I get home. This is another thing. Like yesterday, I, uh, my wife had an ultrasound uh, for, our, for our second child. And um, uh, they were advertising um, AI ultrasounds. So like, like literally that it would identify like particular anomalies and then it would like send them to you yeah like after you got it yeah it's very weird it's like in everything now. yeah uh, radiologists are already working as centaurs mad machine hybrid systems yeah. um because radiologists have you know have the experience and the judgment and the ability to pull together multiple things into a coherent diagnosis mm -hmm. on the other hand ai systems have much better color discrimination yeah and right. like, uh, actually seeing anomalies right yeah right yeah. and and so these, these two systems working together are better than either one on working by itself. And again, this is one of these things that sounds creepy until you realize it might actually prevent you from, you know, it might get your lung cancer mm -hmm. treated timely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, you know, it, it's probably not as creepy as dying from preventable lung cancer. So, <laughs> you know, so it's like we have to negotiate how we're going to engage with mm -hmm. this. But companies, you're right, they cast a very, very broad net. Um, and the thing is, everything is getting smart very quickly. Connectivity has gotten incredibly cheap. Multimodal connectivity has gotten incredibly cheap. It's now very easy for uh, something like a car to phone home in a, in a way that it wouldn't have been mm -hmm. before. Um, we've, we've got much, much denser penetration of wireless networks, and that's before we talk about satellite internet, mm -hmm. um, which is also, you know, at, at this point, Starlink alone has something like 25 times as many satellites as existed in the entire world about 25 years ago. So, um, and that's, uh, we've got new constant, whole new constellations going up. And um, anyway, so, uh, but, but getting back to the point here, so you've, um, so you've got the, the positive economic incentive to do this. You also, um, you, you've, you've got a low price point at which you can do it. So there are a few practical barriers and you've got no regulatory framework that's really constraining you. So that's why the FCC voted on, um, on Thursday, actually, that we were going to start um, exploring, well, we were gonna pass rules setting up a system for voluntary IoT device labeling. Now, I think all of this is important. Voluntary is important because we don't want to make it mandatory. This is the process that we contemplate. What would that look like? Give me a product category and tell me what it would look like on the box. Yeah, okay. So there, there'll be a badge on the box with a QR code and you scan it and it gives you various information. Like, uh, for example, the patch, uh, the, the security patch commitment period for this product mm. is until, let's say, May 1st, 2029. Mm. Um, so uh, I mean that's that's you know a particular headline item. There'd be other things about uh, uh, there'd be other things about its ca capabilities and composition, etc. But the idea is that this label, importantly, uh, 
this um, I'm I'm pleased to say I and my team had a, had a lot of input in some of uh, the features we really cared about. One of those was we wanted that patch commitment term to be uh, affirmative and specific, mm -hmm. not just well we may support it up until X date or the longest we'll support it. Um, I'm sorry, or we you know the support begins on such and such date. Mm -hmm. You know we wanted no we wanted there is an affirmative commitment to um, to I, to patch any critical vulnerabilities. Critically, the critical vulnerabilities part is on a reasonable man definition. So it's not just, well, if it's in this database, it's critical. If it's not, then it's not. Instead, it's it's more like, how would a reasonable person react to this intrusion or react to no, no news of this emerging exploit? Mm -hmm. Anyways, so, but that's a commitment that's enforceable in state court. You don't have to come to the FCC for mother may I permission to do it. You can go to your local courthouse and get private enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, obviously a state AG could go and bring a consumer suit. Mm -hmm. um, We've had to start looking at it this way because until now, wireless security practices have been abominable <laughs> and they've been so bad because there's never been a way for liability to get pushed up to the manufacturer or software designer. Mm -hmm. With product liability that was such as we're familiar with, you know, if you get in your car and you explode and it explodes, you've got someone to sue, yeah. right? But on the other hand, and what's more, if you didn't have it under federal law, you would still have it as a tort, mm -hmm. right? But there's there's no tort of like bad connectivity or I leaked your data, mm -hmm. and and so getting to um, getting to a system where you can push tort like liability up the chain and say no you actually can't disclaim this, you have to make this commitment. If it's a voluntary program, so you can do whatever you, what you want in the free market. If people want to buy devices that are not compliant with this voluntary program, they can do that all day. Mm -hmm. But if you do want the label, then you have to do all this and you have to stand behind it, behind it and you will get sued, including by private citizens, mm -hmm. if you fail in these commitments. I think that's a really important part of, um, of getting, for example, municipal and state procurement offices or of getting insurers to start actually asking the question, was there something in this incident where better cybersecurity and equipment better data privacy and equipment could have made a difference. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the question, well, why in the world are you buying the insecure equipment? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 it is, I think, one of the gentlest ways to create valuable market pressure. It's like through this, like I, I feel very similarly about nutrition facts, right? Like once upon a time, it was like the good libertarian position to say, well, it's sort of turning to put nutrition facts. No, it's like it's creating transparency that then allows for consumers to make more informed decisions. It's obviously a good thing. And then, yeah, at the procurement level, I mean, you know, if you're a school district, you're buying 30,000 of something, you know, pencil sharpener. And it's like if the pencil sharpener is sending data up to the cloud or something huh? stupid like that, then yeah, it's like probably good to know when the security updates are going to be. I don't know. Yeah. I wonder if there's an AI pencil sharpener yet, but yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It freaked me out here. But yeah. So, so I guess is there any tendency or exploration going on right now about the idea that certain device categories should be free of iot capability in general like should it be possible to have a you know cars kind of an extreme example because mapping software all that stuff but can can we have a car that's just a car or can we have a you know a light bulb that's just a light bulb or, or what have you yeah i mean smart light bulbs it's you know it's sort of a funny thing to think about but it's getting harder and harder to get away from i think this will probably be a luxury option in the mm -hmm. future i want a no connectivity device mm -hmm. i want a device with a, a hard kill switch mm -hmm. um i mean Everyone's, everyone saw the famous picture of Mark Zuckerberg with uh, with tape over his webcam. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, e e even even the king of um, even the king of monetizing data can't get away from it. You know, without a rather crude workaround. Of course, now they have a little sliding switch that yeah. like physically blocks it out. You know, the, the technological innovation continues. Yeah. But um, but I I think it's that. Companies are just going to be forced to confront us with the question, well, do you want to accept the discount to let us get your data, like the guy with the free TV, mm -hmm. or do you want to pay a premium mm -hmm. to have a, uh, what is truly a dumb device? Um, let's not forget, though, that when we're talking connected devices, we're not necessarily talking antisocial applications or e even dubious applications or uncomfortable applications. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, we're talking vital applications. Mm -hmm. um, if you look, at, um, if you look at, at manufacturing and logistics in China, there are some amazing factory videos of automated facilities. Like mm -hmm. we're talking, we're talking base station, um, base station fabrication factories 
that might have in the dozens of employees and are churning out thousands of, of 5G base stations. Amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at, like, for example, a JD.com, uh, which is sort of Chinese Amazon a little mm -hmm. bit, um, uh, more logistics side. But if you look at one of their videos of how their warehouses work, it's all, you know, it's cameras and smart carts and, and smart multi-direction conveyor belts and robotic arms picking and packing. And, you know, I, I mean, a lot of this stuff is is powered by this kind of sophisticated wireless networking, data oceans and AI. Mm -hmm. And um, likewise, when I, when I look at a utility and I'm asking myself, how is this power utility going to handle load balancing among wind and solar and nuclear and coal and natural gas all in one grid without causing a, a, a single brownout in anyone's neighborhood? I mean, really? That's crazy. What yeah. if the what if the weather changes? <laughs> you know, like yeah, what if <laughs> you know? Fancy that. Sometimes it does. But you know, like what don't don't we want to bring in mm -hmm. as much tech as possible mm -hmm. to try and address this mm -hmm. kind of stuff? And what does the connectivity look like for that? What ex, what attack surface are we mm -hmm. exposing with this? I take a very meat and potatoes one with utilities. Um, their uh, their their state public utilities regulators are very often asking them mm -hmm. to build fewer new plants by uh, using smart thermostats to manage current usage. And the thought is do that in a non-obnoxious way. Mm -hmm. And the rate payers will, pro will probably prefer this to having to pay for new plants as often, mm -hmm. right? Um, more often. So the difficulty is what if the smart thermostats are something where you can actually turn on everyone's air conditioning at once in mm -hmm. the dead of winter and brown out the grid and no one knows what's going on, Yeah, you know? So getting our arms wrapped around the costs and benefits of this stuff is, um, is a challenge. It, the data, the personal data stuff is obviously alarming, but the systems operation data and the controls um, have so much upside that I don't know how we evolve uh, past our current level of, um, of productivity without getting there. Yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's, a famous, there's a famous joke uh, all the way back in the 80s. You see computers everywhere these days, except in the productivity numbers. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm I'm really interested about what happens when we break this out of you know the email and and web surfing machine, yeah. and instead have it sorting our packages for us, yeah. and you know and manufacturing stuff for us. Yeah, well, and that's the hope is that we can actually start to see those kind of transformative gains in productivity that technological progress promises, as opposed to like a new way to like you know get scoliosis and like you know be addicted to your phone right. all day. They promised us flying cars, and we got 140 characters. So true, yep. so true indeed. Um, uh, pivoting slightly, I, th I think one of the, it feels like the final frontier of communications technology uh, is what Elon Musk is doing with Starlink. Um, it'll be hilarious when, you know, it single-handedly justifies every investment dollar that was ever put into SpaceX when they, you know, split it off and IPO it on its own. Um, you know, I, I, I got my start in politics and state politics where like rural broadband boondoggles were like something fought over every legislative session. Um, you know, you have the the eagle's eye perch looking at this. What, what does Starlink's titanic success almost overnight mean for how we think about how people across the world are connected to the internet at all? The first license application started eight years ago. By now, we've got more than five thousand satellites, I believe, and we've got um, and we've got consistent speeds of one hundred down and twenty up, which would have been very premium tier. Yeah. Um, just again, ten or fifteen years ago. Um, you know that Weird Al song, All About the Pentiums? He brags about having a T1 line in his house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, a, a Starlink connection is roughly 50 times faster, somewhat more than 50 times faster yeah. downlink. So um, I realize that song's kind of old, but no, nonetheless, it, that's all from space. And that's all from satellites that mm -hmm. just went up. That's crazy. Um, the rural broadband thing is such an interesting point. You know how much it costs to trench fiber? Depending where you are, two, between two and five dollars per foot. Mm -hmm. It's just expensive to to trench. Mm -hmm. I, that's not to say fiber isn't a great technology. Yeah. Fiber. The United States is how large across two thousand miles, something <laughs> like that, right? Oh, like, it's, it's more. I think it's yeah. more than that. It, it yeah. takes me fourteen hours to drive to yeah. Florida, and I, and so like driving pretty fast. I would say, like probably what a thousand miles just to get from here to Miami. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, so it's not just that you're crisscrossing the United States, but that you're trying to reach every, um, in FCC jargon, every BSL, broadband serviceable location in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like the fugitive. Mm -hmm. You know, I want you to search every, um, you know, every outhouse, hen house, you know, cat house, dog yeah. house, you know. <laughs> it's it's yeah. a little bit like that, except we're yeah. supposed to build fiber to them. Yeah. Um, and 
you can completely see the motivation at a certain point because if we want to have pervasive connectivity in the United States, for a long time it looked like it was a choice between spending the money and putting up with backward development. Mm -hmm. And of course, every jurisdiction was going to reach its own conclusions mm -hmm. on that. But the reality was that if you that at some point you were going to have to spend more if you wanted more connectivity because you just had to build more physical infrastructure on the ground. So I want to rewind to the early 90s. Motorola was putting together an audacious plan to launch the Iridium constellation. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was Motorola looked at the world and they said, look, you know how many cell towers you have to build to cover this? <laughs> the range is so minuscule. We're yeah. actually better off launching 66 satellites. Yeah. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah. And and to tell you- So that, my dad did. He did like deployments of cell towers in cities. Like that's what he did for years. It was well, pain in the <laughs> well, but but that's that's the rub because yeah. because the the cell phone industry on on the, on the terrestrial side realized you don't have to cover the whole world you just have to cover the cities yeah but now that we're actually asking about covering the world then the old rationale from the early nineties comes back if you actually want to cover the world you know Iridium was doing things that no cell company could ever have done it was letting people make calls from the open ocean it was letting make people literally make calls from the North Pole there mm -hmm. was this one early Iridium investor who would uh, who would call up Dan Colusi, who was the, the the guy who bought it out of bankruptcy, every time he did a North Pole trip. He'd be like, <laughs> hey, Dan, guess where I am now? You know? <laughs> and it, like, if you want to do true global coverage, satellite has always been the only way. Mm -hmm. It's the point that I'm getting to with this. Mm -hmm. And when you look around the United States, it's become a commonplace for people to say, hey, I'm driving, you know, I'm driving in my neighborhood. I don't have 4G. I don't have 5G. I have no G. I don't have bars. Well, Satellite is one way of addressing this that might be more accessible to a lot of these people than building a cell tower every few miles and having to justify the sunk cost of doing that and having to find radios to sell mm -hmm. to put on it. Mm -hmm. It actually might be cheaper to do satellites, just the same way that the Motorola guys thought in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the, so my takeaway from this is that, my takeaway from this is that since we have a new satellite connectivity model, that at this point um, has has uh, proven itself very technically strong. Mm -hmm. I've, I've I've actually you know, I, I hang out with network engineers sometimes. It's because you know because I'm not a nerd or anything. <laughs> but, and I I took a really interesting call with a sort of elder statesman network engineer um, who's done done fantastic work on the back end of networks and firmware for a long time. And you know he was in a boat. He was connected on Starlink. He had better yeah. latency than me, and I was right. In, I was on fiber in McLean, Virginia. <laughs> Pro I could I could probably have thrown a baseball underhand and hit a data center living in Northern Virginia. Yeah. You know, like come on. Yeah. Um. So so the fact that he could get better latency than me on his boat, like really, yeah. it was this this you know this 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 sailboat off the coast of California. It was wild. Yeah. And um, this has obviously changed the equation for all sorts of places where wireline is just expensive to connect. Mm -hmm. Another th another thing is that fixed wireless is also proliferating all over, and that's also mm -hmm. a good model. That's very often the model in countries that don't have a big history mm -hmm. of wireline infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, India is very bullish. Fixed, fixed. Wi fixed wireless is doing you know the kind of modem you have inside your cell phone, but doing it like your Wi-Fi router. Exactly. Yeah. Right, exactly. So it's, so, it's, so they can engineer the beam to one house mm -hmm. instead of having to track place. Uh, track a phone all over the place. Mm -hmm. Right now, a lot of the companies that do this use the same frequencies as your phone, but some are, uh, there are some, um, including some that are working with state governments right now in the broadband fund deployment that use much higher frequencies and can get very, very high throughput rates mm -hmm. on that. So it's an exciting area of technology. Anyway, getting back to Sala, I don't, I don't think there's any ratio, there's, there's, there's anything other than path dependent reasons um, to do any other approach. I think all the reliability mm -hmm. concerns that have been mooted about satellites are very dubious. Mm -hmm. um, I think the performance speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. I, at this point, you would ask, why would you do it any other way? If 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 we were if if we had to start from scratch, let's say a new island rises up out of the ocean, we have to start from scratch. Yeah. There's no infrastructure. And we just you do Starlink. Of course, yeah. Like that's what you would do your first day. Yeah. And then if you figured out that wireline made more sense at some specific points, then mm -hmm. you would build wireline at those points. But otherwise, you would you would use satellite as your go-to backend from the yeah. first day. What enabled this like Cambrian explosion of, of satellite? Was it the uh, like SpaceX's ability to like reliably get cargo up and down, or what? What was it? SpaceX drove the cost of launch through the floor. Yeah, the cost of cargo to orbit through the yeah. floor. Yeah. Um, Motorola had to go had to go through such contortions to get the Iridium mm -hmm. constellation launched. Mm -hmm. It was some Chinese rockets. It was some Russian rockets. It was you know it was, it was just two here, three here. Um, the the stories they the, the folks from those days have to tell about doing business in 
pre-2001 China, really something. Like, <laughs> like the, 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 the Red Army Rocket Corps would come along and lock them in <laughs> barracks at night until the, until the manager was like, no, you're not locking up my employees. But that's what they wanted to do. You know what I mean? So, but, but that's what they had to put up with yeah. because the, you, there just wasn't much launch capacity. You had to go find an unused long march onshore in, in the PRC. Mm. Um, by driving the cost of launch and the key, uh, down and the cadence of launch up, well, obviously mm. there's, there's an organic relationship there. Um, it actually becomes practical to populate a 5,000 satellite constellation. Now, obviously, there have been other advances too in uh, solid state electronics and beam forming. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the concepts behind what we're seeing in Starlink have at least been theoretically viable for 30 years plus. Mm -hmm. But it's often the execution. It's getting mm -hmm. it to the point where you can scale it, mm -hmm. where you can routinize the charisma. Yeah. And... Um, As brother Elon does. <laughs> well, I mean, you yeah. know, quantity has a quality all of its own. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Uh, a final question before we go to our members only segment, uh, TikTok. Uh, there's a lot of discourse about uh, TikTok in Washington. You, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but again, this is one of those issues where there's there's big differences of opinion. And I sort of find myself in the middle of, of a lot of them on, on what the best approach is. Um, you know, when the national security establishment of the United States wants something unanimously, I tend to turn my nose up at it structurally, but I also don't like China very much. So t tell us what is what is your theory of TikTok and the, the, the conversations going on around the particular piece of legislation that's moving in the house right now um tiktok as um as a venue seems really successful tiktok as an application is sort of worrying it, it really it did you ever see that episode of silicon valley where they have jared saying you know actually our only product is is um malicious malware <laughs> you know? i've seen the clip yeah yeah a dangerous malware yeah. is what he says yeah so it's it's a there is this aspect to it yeah. tiktok does a lot of things to exfiltrate data from your phone yeah um, I mean, that's, even if you love the app, that's that's just undeniably true. And I guess maybe how you value your data is mm -hmm. how much you care about what it's exfiltrating. But it may be taking more than you think, talking about Americans feeling nervous about how much of their data is out there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like it's the nicest company in the world, even if it is a very successful mm -hmm. short video product. I kind of wish Vines was still around. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I feel that was like, a deep cut. <laughs> I feel like a lot of the comedy beats of TikTok really grew up on Vines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. there are probably a lot of TikTokers who watch who are successful watch Vines compilations at some point. Or like, right. ah, you know, this is how I'll structure my skit. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyways, it's so it's very popular as an app. I guess I would say I like a whole of tech approach. Yeah. I don't like singling out individual companies. Yeah. Um, naming for one thing, naming a company in a bill is uh, usually a signal to a court that that bill that you know there should be some sort of enhanced scrutiny on judicial mm -hmm. review. Um, forcing a divestment of a specific company, you know, I mean it's it's possible. Uh, uh, people people tend to forget that uh, that Grinder was <laughs> was was addressed similarly yeah. back in 2018, yeah. right? There was a forced divestment of Chinese ownership of Grindr on the, on the view there'd be sensitive data. And <laughs> some very sensitive data. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's not like it's unprecedented. Yeah. But, it, but again, it, it is a little funny. I guess my, my take is that there's just, we, our real concern is whole of tech. We've been talking today about all kinds of companies that aren't mm -hmm. TikTok. In fact, TikTok didn't really come up until now. Mm -hmm. Instead, we've been talking about the most uh, staid old economy companies on earth. We've been talking about car companies. We've been talking about utilities. We've been talking about uh, credit bureaus. We've been talking about, um, about very pedestrian f social functions. Now, of course, we've been talking about the big socials too. Mm -hmm. But the point is that there, there needs to be a whole of government response to what exactly it means to see people getting censored, mm -hmm. what see, to see people getting propagandized and what we're gonna do about it. I frankly don't feel like a winner if we ban TikTok, but we allow, um, we allow un unelected, mm -hmm. unaccountable black box gremlins inside big tech and big social to shape our discursive environment in an election mm -hmm. year. I don't, I don't feel that that's a win. Well, and especially, you know, just being realist about the uphill battle it is to get anything passed in Washington. I do think a, 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 an undeniable point is that the political energy behind doing something about TikTok should be sublimated into a whole of tech approach to, so that you don't just clip this highly politically salient thing and leave a giant aspect of the overall problem behind. That is, that, that is I, I completely yeah. agree with that. We, we, it, to the extent we think this is a problem, it's indicative of a much larger problem of onshore foreign source tech taking data out of us and pushing patches back in where we have no idea what they do. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's part of uh, it's part of the gen general question of data privacy that has nothing to do with in particular with any mm -hmm. specific country. Although maybe the point is sharpened with mm -hmm. some countries. Um, we don't. And, and my my worry is that it stops being salient. Everyone mm -hmm. declares victory and goes home, and then um, all the all the other malign stuff just keeps simmering away below the surface. Except this time, it's even more entrenched because it took so much effort to get TikTok that no one's ever going to go through that much again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one wants to hear about doing big tech legislation for another like two years after a big right. TikTok fight. So when you so when you think about it, there you can see a lot of companies that would have various interests in, <laughs> in making TikTok's life hard right yeah. now for the, in anticipation of future benefits. Yeah. We'll go now to our member segment. For those of you who aren't aware, we started a membership program this year for season four of Moment of Truth, where you can become a truther or a statesman on YouTube. When you do so, you get the episodes 24 hours early on Sunday, as well as special members only bonus segments uh, where we uh, both go really, really dark and ask people what they're terrified about the future, but also very light uh, talking about uh, some of their personal interests and hobbies. So go to YouTube and subscribe to American Moments membership program. You can be a truther or a statesman and get all sorts of benefits. All right, Commissioner. If you're listening to this, you're almost certainly a highly sophisticated news consumer, but even the most dogged of DC politicos need a news aggregator to help them out. We're big fans of Upward News here at American Moment. Ari David has actually been a previous guest on this show. We highly recommend you check out that episode. But Upward.News is a way that our team keeps in touch with all of the crazy news stories going on around the world. Your Twitter feed is not necessarily 100% reliable to get a proper cross-section of everything going on that matters. Upward News is a fantastic young media startup that is really Really putting together fantastic newsletters and social media content that helps people digest the news, especially if you're tired of being on the phone with your parents and explaining news stories to them multiple times a week because you're the politico in the family. I highly recommend encouraging them to follow upward.news. They do a free five minute daily email that you can sign up for at readupward.com or even better, www.ihatefakenews.com. Uh, it's time for a palate cleanse from politicos, punch bowls, and pucks. Uh, try Upward News today. We highly recommend it. Ari's an incredibly smart patriot, and they're a new player on the block focused on cutting through the noise and de de delivering smart analysis. Please check them out. Absolutely fascinating uh, and an extremely fun conversation, Commissioner. How can people keep up with everything that you're doing, um, the policy initiatives you're working on at the FCC, and in general, the things that you're saying? Uh, best way to find out what I'm working on is to read Brendan Carr's Twitter. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you look at his, if you look at, um, at at my official Twitter, I think I have seven tweets in four years, something like that. And they're, you know, and and uh, Commissioner Carr's sort of on the other side of it. Yeah. So, but but if it's if it's something important, he's probably going to tweet about it at some point. Yeah. Um, as as far as stuff that I'm interested in working, I guess like guess the answer would be, the FCC traditionally talked mainly to its regulatees. Mm -hmm. Most most people didn't have a lot of skin on skin in the game on what the the rules were for splitting mm -hmm. poll attachment fees among the poll owner and you know and when you had to replace it. That was a sort of a technical question. If you're attaching stuff to a poll, you care, and otherwise you don't. And most people don't. Mm -hmm. I think almost everyone has skin in the game at the FCC now. Uh, this, the cyber trust mark uh, proceeding that I was talking about, we had all sorts of interesting characters come in and comment on this. National Association of Manufacturers came in. I was really yeah. gratified to see their filing because that shows their thinking. Mm -hmm. What is the role of this equipment in onshore manufacturing? Yeah. Um, National Power Tool Association mm -hmm. came in. I think they, they might that might be their first filing ever outside of um, outside of license filings on specific pieces of equipment. Um, <laughs> The Chinese WTO ministry came in <laughs> and they included a bilingual filing yeah. with the Chinese first, yeah. to make a point. Um, and, well, that's probably the official document. Yeah. Yeah, the English one is probably not official for their purposes. I don't know. I'm, yeah. not, I'm pretty far from a Chinese lawyer. But the point is, we, we had really interesting commentary from non-traditional corners. Yeah. And I think a lot of people um, should be asking themselves right now, what does it look like to define my operating environment? What does it look like to define my vendor environment mm -hmm. in the future? And maybe if the answer is to come into the FCC, then I would love to have those conversations. We go out and, and find startups to talk to. We go out and find unconventional people to talk to. Um, my team, uh, I, I said, you know, we're going to sort of run it like a sales staff. Everyone's going to have a territory. Everyone's going to have people that they regularly call. And then we're going to go out and recruit new prospects. And that model has gotten us a lot of meetings, including some very odd ones. And it's been <laughs> in, immensely informative. It's part of what makes it such a great job. That's fantastic. Um, again, like you, you're 
an encyclopedia on this stuff. And and I I'm, I've still been thinking the entire time we've been talking about how you you know your unique background that was sort of due to some of the restrictions around what kind of people can end up being FCC commissioners gave you just all this added alpha to, to doing your job. So it's, it, it's you know, for, for all the people who are in the personnel business that listen to this show, like be thinking about like, what's what's the analog at, at every agency for someone who has this like orthogonal view that can provide real value. Just, just an incredible joy. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming on. It was a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We certainly enjoyed taping it. Um, just again, like, it's a great example of what we mean when we say we want people with heterodox backgrounds in government. It's, you know, the the, the meme among a very certain uh, cohort in Washington is like, you know, we need a true outsider in government. We need someone with no ties to the establishment. We need a homeless person. That's not exactly what we're going for. We're going for people who have just an orthogonal cut on, on these uh, critical issues that aren't highly politically connected, but that organizations like ours and many others can bring uh, into the fold so that they can serve their country. Commissioner Symington is a great example of what we mean when we say we want outsiders in government. Uh, just a, a ton of fun. Be sure, as always, to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find the backlog of this show and everything else we have cooking. Become a truther or a statesman by becoming a member of this podcast on YouTube. Get the episodes 24 hours early. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscriber growth has been skyrocketing we're now over 4,000 subscribers on YouTube, um, uh, largely because of David Sachs' speech, which is fantastic. You should go watch it from our gala for American statecraft. Um, but be sure to also rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you guys, as always, for listening. We will see you next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment podcast taped at the Conservative Partnership Campus Studios and is produced by Jake Mercier, Jared Cummings, Tiffany Kutris, and Matthew Pearson. Our intro song is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich, and our website is AmericanMoment.org.